Once again, this is Blue Tube Television. I'm Timothy Alexander White, your host and master of ceremonies. And today we are getting the opportunity to talk to people who have come on Festival Miss C for so many years. And Pastor Daryl Armstrong, he's been our pastor here, and he's been coming for quite some years, and he's sitting with me today. Pastor, it is so good to see you again. Always. Shake in. How are you doing? How are things going? Listen, uh, things are going well. Uh -huh. Church is going well back good. home in Trenton, uh -huh. New Jersey. Um, I, my daughter just graduated from junior high to high school. So. Okay. Like most fathers, I got I to gotta dust my, my bat off and make sure the boys are put in line. But uh, we're doing well. The kids are great. Uh, my son's going to eighth grade uh -huh. and um, daughter's going to ninth grade. Okay. So. Now, your church, it's, it's a historical church. Or is it you're the third pastor in like 100 years? The church itself is 130 years church, old, 1880, the Shallow Baptist Church of Trent, New Jersey. Uh -huh. you, everyone is always welcome. If you're between New York or Philadelphia, come on out to the Shallow Baptist Church. Check us out on YouTube or Facebook, uh, www.shallowtrenton.org. Right. Um, 130 year old church, we found in 1880. Mm -hmm. And you weren't the first pastor. I was not right? the first pastor. Uh, <laughs> but from 1904 uh -huh. to present, we've only had three pastors. Three, okay. So the Reverend Dr. John White was there from 1904 to 1946, mm -hmm. so 42 years. Uh, my predecessor was there from 1946 to 1999, uh -huh. 53 years. So in, nine, in a span of 95 years, I only had two pastors. Okay. And then in the last hundred and um, 17 and some odd years, uh -huh. I'm the, the third pastor. Now, what is the size of your congregation? We, obviously, there's a paper church and a real church, as right. they say, so we are about 2,000 on paper, okay. um, about 1,000 active. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So not a mega church, not a small church. Now, your background, history, your education, even though you're in New Jersey, mm -hmm. you've got a lot of your education in California, is that correct? I did, I did. Born and raised in Los Angeles, um, went up to the Bay Area, did my undergraduate work and public policy and then came east in 1995 to mm -hmm. go to seminary. Mm -hmm. So my, um, my, my elementary, I mean my um, primary, secondary, and undergrad work is in California. Mm -hmm. So when did you start being a pastor? Yeah, yeah. Um, I accepted my call in 1990 uh -huh. after a trip to South Africa um, when I was in my, the summer before my senior year in college. Uh -huh. So I thought I was gonna major in public policy go get a, a you know, master's in public policy, work in government. And you and I both know the quickest way to make God laugh is to make plans for yourself. Right, exactly. So <laughs> I, I, coming back from this amazing two and a half month time in South Africa, mm -hmm. where I met Archbishop Desmond Tutu, it was the year Nelson Mandela was re released from 27 years of imprisonment. Uh -huh. So it was an amazing year to be in that country. Right. And um, coming back from that experience after two and a half months, I said, Lord, I'm about to go into my senior year in college. I, I gave up something, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. to do this trip, this mission trip. Right. Um, why, why did I do this? Why did you have me do this? And so I really believe at that point, God said, hey, let go of what you want, follow what I want for you. Okay. And that's why I accepted my call. Okay. So that was, that was 20, uh, you know, 20, 20, 30 some years ago. Yeah, 30 some years ago. It's a tough yeah. job, isn't it? Pastoring people? Uh, the, the toughest part of being a pastor is dealing with families in their most traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, and all, a lot of that has to do with death. Mm -hmm. And so when I have to bury someone's child, um, bury someone's husband or wife after an untimely death, right, right. we know that the 96-year-old senior saints who lived a full life and they're just on their way to get their wings, mm -hmm. that's a different kind of homegoing celebration. Right. But when it's a, it's a traumatic loss, gang-related violence in a city like Trenton, although it's not an urban, uh, it's an urban context, it's not a, 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 a huge city, it's only 80,000 people, but it, is, it has all the issues in, uh, of a, a, as a microcosm uh -huh. of Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Chicago. Okay. So you deal with urban violence, you deal with gang violence, you're dealing with untimely death of, you, of youth, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's for me been the tough, toughest yeah. part of that. So you do work in, in, in a sense in government, I do. City government, right? I do. Well, city I, I work. Trenton, right? I work closely with city uh, officials at the municipal, county, state, and federal level. The congresswoman for our congressional district. She's a member of our church. Okay. The Honorable Bonnie Watson Coleman. Uh -huh. um, the state senator for our state district is a member of our congregation, and the me former mayor of the city of Trenton is a member of our congregation. So our congregation um, does have a hand in civic affairs. My predecessor, uh, the Reverend Dr. Woodson, was the first uh, speaker of any state legislature in America. 
back in the 70s. Okay. So um, I followed a, into the shoes of a um, clergyman who bridged that divide between church and state. Okay, yeah. okay. So we were talking off camera just a little while ago about, you know, when you look at what goes on, uh, what's going on in our uh, country, our mm -hmm. society, in the world, you know, back when you first, you know, accepted your calling, you know, you, we see things mm -hmm. a certain way, but then we always have to sort of align things up from a spiritual standpoint mm -hmm. of what God is talking, what God is saying, what God is speaking about. Mm -hmm. Do you see that these days are people migrating towards their religious beliefs or do you see people spreading away from the belief system and, you know, it's tougher now to get people to accept Christ, accept God in yeah. their lives. Do you yeah. see a... It's a great question. And, and here's what I, my, my immediate response uh, quotes and cites the work of the American Theological, the Association of Theological Schools, ATS, uh -huh. which is one of the leading accrediting body for mm -hmm. schools of religion, schools of divinity, so forth and so on. They have said um, uh, unequivocally that the, 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 the demise of mainstream Christianity mm -hmm. is what we're witnessing right now. So as mainline churches, your Methodists, your Lutherans, your Presbyterians, your Episcopalians, your Baptists, those denominational structures are declining. Mm -hmm. And what is increasing are non-denominational, congregational, congregationally based, um, almost kind of sporadically uh, popping up uh, houses of worship that are founded and started um, almost in a Pentecostal tradition. Uh -huh. So most schools of religion and our theology will acknowledge that they, see, they have seen a uh, precipitous decline in the number of applications to schools of religion mm -hmm. because this kind of organic grassroots movement of Christianity uh -huh. is more Pentecostal, it is less formal, um, and it makes sense with what's going on denominationally, right? Mm -hmm. We're an I, we're, we're, we're way past my generation, right? right Gen right, X. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're now into Gen Z's, Gen I Gen's, Gen Y's, and their tolerance for structures mm -hmm. um, is much Diminished. different than ours, yeah. right? And so they're not looking to go into structures and formal. They want this indigenous, mo uh, indigenous movement of, of faith. And so mm -hmm. they will not, rarely will you hear this generation say, I'm Christian. Many of them will simply say, I'm, I'm spiritual. Right, right. Now, I've heard that. I've I'm seen spiritual. That happen. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's a very clear statement mm -hmm. that they are rejecting the formality mm -hmm. of mainline Christianity or even mainline structures, not only within Christianity. The same is true in Islam and the same is true in other formal structures, even kind of non-Christian non structures mm -hmm. that we, would, we might have a, a question about, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons. Um, if, there, if there's a formality and a structure to it, this generation is rejecting that. I see. And, I, and so I think what we're experiencing is um, what some would say the browning of the Christian church, mm -hmm. which means it's more of a Pentecostal movement and it is, it is centered more in Africa and South America and Central America. And, and so what is now happening is that mainline Christian organizations um, and denominations are having to re rekindle and retool themselves well, to say, how do we reach? About that. I was going to ask how about do we that reach as a pastor, this? what would you do or what are you doing to sort of uh, change from what's been structured yep. for hundreds of years to yep. reach that generation? So, so, so my philosophy on this, Tim, is um, a mixed bag, right? Because I don't believe in throwing babies out with bath water, mm -hmm. right? I don't believe in, in de uh, denigrating and denuding the Christian church, uh -huh. right? Because some would say in order to reach this generation seeker friendly, you have to e emasculate the church of all of its traditional markings. Right. No crosses, no communion tables, right? We just want a one name word. We don't even want a denomination attached to I've the seen name. Churches that don't have crosses. Nope, on the that's my point. Yeah. How can you listen? I'm yeah. I'm old school, right? You. In this sense, I'm I'm I'm, board, I'm straddling that border. But for me to have a church with no cross. For me, it's almost sacrilegious, uh -huh. but it is appealing to this generation. Exactly. And those churches and those structures are seeing the rise of mega churches. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking myself, is this a movement? Does this portend the constant reality that is talking about in scripture about we will heap up for ourselves folk we want to hear? That's right. As opposed to hearing folk who are sent mm -hmm. with a message well, that doesn't buy yeah. into kind of 
uh, the watering down of the Christian faith. And being old school like that, now I'm old school too, mm -hmm. but does it matter a great deal? I'm just saying that if the building doesn't have a cross, but God's word is yeah. being... Yeah, you know. yeah. And, and so that is the counter, right? Yeah. So how much emphasis do we place on structures and buildings? Right, right. Uh, because many of these non-denominational churches are popping up in factories mm -hmm. that can, they can turn on a key, open it up one day, and turn it off the other day, yeah. which simply says the building isn't what's important. Exactly. What's going on in the building right. is what's most important. It's and that I will always, I will always hold that up. Yeah. Right. And because God's word is what's going to last. Because what what happened to the Jews in in diaspora? when Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael, that period of Jewish history was the, was the moment when synagogues arise. Mm -hmm. What are synagogues? Synagogues are no longer based on temples right. and tabernacles. Right. Synagogues are based in the gathering of God's people. So whenever you had 10 families, 10 men mm -hmm. with their families gathered together, they constituted a synagogue. Yeah. And they had to do that because they couldn't get back to the temple in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They were in Babylon. So how do we keep our faith in Babylon when there's no building? There's no temple. Right. We still come together and have worship. That's no different than what the Bible says. With yes. two or three are gathered together. Are gathered together in my name. Touching and agreeing on things yes. concerning him. Yes. He'll be in our presence yes. and he'll be in our midst. Yeah. We are, are sitting talking with Pastor Darrell Armstrong, and I'm going to end it here because of uh, just recording times. Uh, but uh, one last question. Uh, very knowledgeable young man, very well informed, and I really love your style. Thank love you, sir. you like a brother, man. I've always I love respected you. Like you. I'd love to hear you speak. But I, want, I got one more question. Yes, sir. How do you have fun? How do you have fun? I, <laughs> how do I let my hair down? I, I, I ain't got no hair. How do I let my hair down? <laughs> how do you have fun? What's it like in your life? What, what do you do for fun? Listen, fish, 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 listen I, I like bike riding. Basketball. I like yeah. bike riding. I like sports, uh -huh. right? So I love going to sporting events. Uh -huh. I love participating in sporting events. I love watching sporting events. Okay. Uh, truth be told, a lot of my members don't like this, but I, I don't mind doing a little dancing every now and then. All right, all right, all right. Uh, but listen, Watch. you got to have fun. You can't be too serious. Yeah. Right. You can't take yourself too serious. Even Bible tells you. And you got to be able to bond with folk in all situations. Yes. Yes. Right. So I, I love trying to make sure folk know I'm serious when I need to be and I'm low key when I need all to right. be. All right. Well, good. You've definitely bonded with Festival of C and Blue World. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you so much. Love you a lot. Hope to see you again next year and years to follow. To this God is Bluetooth Television. I'm Timothy Alexander White, Pastor Darrell Armstrong. Thank you for watching. Boom. <laughs>